Please do. Okay, I got it. Uh, good evening. Evening. Welcome to the fireside chat by AMR Declaration Trust. We have Professor Hendrik Wegener, who is a legendary figure in the field of antimicrobial resistance, especially in relation to animal health. His profound contributions over the past three decades have made him a hero in the AMR world. His work, notably in advocating for the ban on growth promoters in animal breeding due to their role in escalating AMR has been both groundbreaking and courageous, often in the face of significant opposition. Today, he holds the esteemed position of chancellor at the University of Copenhagen, highlighting his remarkable journey and enduring impact in the field of epidemiology and public health. Professor Hendrik, from your extensive experience, how do you view the current landscape of AMR and what are the most concerning trends you see? Thank you very much. Um, I must admit that it's um, challenging to watch the constantly increasing problems in terms of AMR, even if it's been more than a decade that I was professionally involved. But, but looking at uh, increasing occurrences of resistance in essentially all domains, and also looking at increasing severity in terms of public health impact of resistance. So the problem, unfortunately, only seems to be worsening. Uh, when you then also look at um, the limited examples of good solutions, both in terms of new antimicrobials, new therapies to replace the old ones, or in um, examples of um, useful interventions that are scalable or transferable. Uh, overall, I think that that paints um, a grim picture and only calls for uh, even more action if we want to turn this uh, unfortunate development. Thank you, Hendrik. Now, in your research and advocacy, you have highlighted the significant impact of growth promotional usage of antibiotics in animal breeding on AMR. Could you elaborate how this practice contributes to the AMR crisis and its implications it holds both animal and human health? <clears throat> right. Um, I can give it a try. So, so uh, I mean, going back to the beginning, uh, I think the first aha revelation, if I can use that term, was that growth promoters were, in fact, antimicrobials. And they were not just antimicrobials. They were also antimicrobials that were essentially similar to antibiotics that were used for therapy in animals as well as in humans. And on top of that, some of them were essentially antimicrobials that in humans were considered uh, drugs of last resort. So uh, seeing that these antibiotics were used as feed additives to uh, animals routinely with the idea that they made the animals grow faster was, of course, uh, as a microbiologist and epidemiologist, a cause of concern. And, and when we eventually also could, could establish the link between the use of growth promoters and the occurrence of resistance in animals that were documentably transferable to humans, it was, I think, um, easy to make the case that this constituted a public health problem. Uh, the more difficult thing is, of course, then to um, make a call for action that could uh, create uh, a change. But that was basically what we did. Hendrik, you know, you and your team have been the pillar of change in Denmark and Europe and inspiring change in veterinary antibiotic usage across the world. Can you discuss the policy changes or initiatives that you have been involved 
we can aim to reduce the antibiotic usage in animals. Uh, indeed, I mean we have we have uh, both in in my country, but also in the European Union, I think managed to over time uh, implement quite a lot of um, policy changes that have been uh, critically necessary to make the changes in the use patterns, which is of course what matters. Again, I firmly believe you have to change the overall use pat pattern to change occurrence of resistance and, and the attendant risks related to animal or public health. Um, of course, the most impactful in terms of, of volumes of antibiotics has been a ban of the use of antibiotics as feed additives or as growth modems, whatever term you prefer. But also uh, actually uh, putting in place uh, effective detailed uh, monitoring of the use of antibiotics is in itself uh, not easy and requires new regulation, which we managed to get in place so we could follow the individual farmers' use of antibiotics in their herds, which made it possible for the authorities to start categorizing uh, farmers and also prescribers, veterinarians, by their use patterns, which in turn led to what we called a, a, a yellow card arrangement so that authorities could contact the extreme high-end users or the extreme high prescribers and discuss with them specifically how can you reduce the use. So that in itself uh, is very important um, because many, most farmers, most veterinarians uh, do a great job, but some have problems and it's important to understand what those problems are and help them address them. Then we also manage, which I think was uh, very useful to restrict or essentially uh, uh, ban the use of a few very uh, important drugs in terms of human health. So some of the last resort, uh, some of the most um, precious drugs for human use, we managed to take out of uh, animal use, which also required regulation. So quite an extensive list of regulations that all somehow supported the same aim, reduce the overall use, but at the same time also even further reduce the use of critically important antibiotics for use in humans uh, in, in the context of their use in animals. Uh, Henrik, you know, Denmark has been a leader, a pioneer in, in, in rationalizing antibiotic usage in the veterinary world. How did Denmark achieved that position. How did uh, you and your team convince the Danish government and rest of the euro to make that change? We would like to know in detail about your journey and how you could make such a remarkable change because change is always slow. Change is always difficult. It is always faced with obstacles. And how could you, how did you face these obstacles and how did all this change happen in Denmark and then in Europe? If you would like to know in detail, please tell us in detail. Take as much as take time as you want. We are very eager to listen to that success story you and your team have made. And, and it is a, a rather long and complex story. I'll try to see if I can also make it understandable and relatively logical. I think the background in the context of my own country, Denmark, a small country in the northern part of Europe, was, uh, let's say, a collective experience already from the late 60s, where MRSA uh, spread um, very fast uh, and to very high levels in our hospitals. Uh, and already at that time, MRSA was seen as a problem in, in terms of nosocomial infections. And it was also found that this spread was driven by the increased use of tetracycline because it was not methicillin use, it was tetracycline use. And the medical profession among themselves, as a, a group of professionals, um, decided to, to manage this problem by, through various um, educational, voluntary, and to some extent developing common codes of conduct in, in the hospitals, uh, they managed to essentially uh, not eliminate, but but markedly reduce the use of tetracyclines, and that made this 
epidemic go away. And, and that was kind of a revealing moment, which led to the medical profession develop very good um, codes of, of um, prescribing practices among themselves. So there was this in the medical profession and the health profession, let's say a general appreciation of, uh, we are quite good at managing AMR. And we also, when we compared Denmark to other countries, consistently noted that Denmark was uh, um, experiencing uh, very low levels of resistance and very, very low health problems relating to resistance due to this constant attention to prudent use. Uh, and uh, I think that is why there was, you could say, when we suddenly, uh, and, and, and my group was, was a, a very strong part of that, when we made this link between the, let's say, rather indiscrim indiscriminate use in animals, and in particular, the completely indiscriminate use uh, as growth promoters, um, it, it, it created a lot of uh, attention, uh, also in the positive sense of that work, because most in the health profession said, now we've worked for decades to control AMR and we managed to keep it at a low level and thereby both keeping health implications and health costs at a very, very reasonable level in this country. And now we potentially see that the uh, food animal production and uh, in part the veterinarians are um, risking to uh, throw all this overboard. So there was a very strong pressure, uh, also a very high sense of alarm, you can say, which made the politicians also react. And, and not only because of the perceived risk, but also because they firmly believed that it was possible to do something based on the experiences from the management of MRSA historically. So, and also based on recent experiences where my own uh, group and uh, in collaboration with industry and others has managed to reduce incidents of foodborne infections from animals to humans uh, um, to a very large extent. So there was already a motivation to uh, intervene at the pre-harvest level. Interventions done in animals don't come back to haunt you in the food production <laughs> and also not at the at the dinner table. So if you can reduce infections by intervening at the level of the animals, you are basically safe throughout the food production chain. And now when we then started talking about antibiotics, it was not so... Um, incomprehensible that we could do interventions in animal production and we already had very good political support for intervening at the at the level of the animal production in order to protect uh, public health so so because we had this say integrated approach from the farm to the patient because we had uh, both the industry and the legislators and the experts already working together on controlling foodborne infections or zoonoses, uh, as we call them broadly. Adding AMR, of course, added a level of complexity, but it was not seen as, you know, something extremely rare and exotic. It was basically just doing the same, focusing not only on the pathogens, but also on the genes they carried. And, and uh, so, so to that end, it was not uh, that complicated. What was complicated, what turned out to be complicated was that, of course, there is a new um, uh, stakeholder involved, which is the industry that produces the antimicrobials and generate, uh, obviously, uh, decent incomes on selling antibiotics. So where we usually had to work very hard to convince farmers that they had to change their production practices to reduce the risk of foodborne infections. Now it got more complicated because it was both farmers, it was prescribing veterinarians, it was the pharmaceutical industry and many other stakeholders who wanted to, let's say, have their voices heard and, and also, of course, having their interests looked after. and. On top of that, what we maybe initially did not realize was that most of this was EU legislation. So Denmark, my own country, could not act independently. When we acted, 
we had to make sure that it could be implemented throughout the European Union, which is 20 some countries and not just our own country. So it was not that trivial. And also um, it, of course, uh, added many new layers of both policy and, and stakeholder involvement and so on and so forth. So, so uh, again, I mean, uh, the, the attention was there, but it, but it was, and it was also seen, so maybe it was very initially, maybe just a, a chance, uh, in, 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 uh, an element of chance in there because um, we found, due to contacts with Germany, Wolfgang Witte, who was at the Robert Koch Institute and, and also a very famous person in the AMR field, uh, working at the Robert Koch Institute, contacted uh, me and asked if we had any knowledge of vancomycin resistant enterococci in animals in Denmark. And uh, at that time, we didn't. Uh, so so uh, Frank Ostrop uh, made a very, very quick survey, and, and we found that they were abundant, and also that there was this link to the use of um, Avoparsin, a glycopeptide, uh, similar to vancomycin, as a growth modent. And that, in turn, in, in a very short time, led our minister to ban this growth modent, maybe not quite um, knowing the implications of doing a national ban on an EU-regulated substance in animal production. So, so quickly, what was seen as a national activity became a European activity. And it was upon us to prove, I believe within six, we six weeks, that there was an association between the use of avoparsin as a growth modent and VRE, vancomycin resistant in humans, in order to support the claim that the use of avoparsin, and that, that at that time it was only this one drug, that the use of this drug constituted a public health risk, which was the only um, possible and, and 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 legally acceptable reason to ban a substance in within the which was in the feed additives legislation. It was not in the animal health legislation. It was not in any public health legislation. It was in legislation about feed animal. Uh, feed for animals, which mainly was about nutrients and vitamins and what have you, but all these antibiotics had been put in there and actually taking them <laughs> up and putting them on the table as a public health risk and banning them was seen as very controversial and led to both a lot of uh, technical challenges, scientific challenges, legal challenges, and... Um, all kinds of other challenges, which took, yeah, many, many, many years to finally get resolved, only concluding with a legal case in the European court in, in Luxembourg, where the pharmaceutical industry had sued the European Commission um, because they eventually took on initially, they were very skeptical. Then when they could not refute our scientific claims, they took it on as EU legislation, which meant that they were sued by the pharmaceutical industry, um, and which meant that we had to go to court with industry with all our scientific data and try to convince the judges that, that our claim that it constituted a public health risk was right. And it worked, uh, and, and we won the court case, which was a landslide event, I would say, because uh, it's not that common that you win that kind of cases in court. Um, and it gave us the necessary backing to shortly after convince the commission that they should put forward a motion to ban all antibiotics as growth modes, which they did. And then they gave a five-year phase-in time for all the member states. And in 2006, um, that was the first year where growth modems were not used in in Europe. But of course, before we came to that, we had had to go through all the individual antibiotics that were used as growth modems and to some extent document their public health 
um, risks, their attendant public health risks, and also document the link between animals and humans through the food chain or directly or the environment or whatever ways. So, so a lot of great research was done, Not certainly not only in, in this country, but in many European countries, because a great coalition of brilliant scientists from all over Europe came together and supported each other in supporting this claim that, I mean, to a, to a microbiologist or to an infectious disease specialist, it sounds completely banal. Of course, if you use antibiotics in animals and, and you eat the products of these animals, then you are exposed to the resistant bacteria that this use creates. But proving it to the extent where it can be used uh, uh, politically to make new regulation or taking it to court and proving it to the extent where a judge also will say that it is completely without, without any reasonable doubt proven that this link is, exists. That was a, a, a huge and very complex scientific undertaking which I'm, I'm quite pleased to have been a part of, uh, but it was certainly also with the help of many great allies from, from many different European countries coming together and also uh, indirectly supported by the great attention from the World Health Organization to the issue and uh, organizing workshops, events, um, bringing together experts who could um, yeah, establish links that were useful to keep the momentum, to keep pushing the agenda, to keep bringing in new data every time uh, we felt that now we could not, you know, make the final little link that was suddenly seen by those who were skeptical as uh, the missing link and therefore nothing should be done. Um, so, so, um, so that was basically what what uh, happened on the uh, growth modens, which is, I think, still the single largest reduction in global antibiotic use that has ever taken place uh, at one time anywhere. That is, all the European countries taking out the use of antibiotics as growth modens. I think overall they constituted half of the European use of antibiotics in terms of volume and overnight uh, this was just uh, removed so so um, i th i think that is a a, a, a wonderful uh, success story uh, i also firmly believe that not only the patterns of use but also the overall volume of use or amount of use is extremely significant in terms of managing antibiotic resistance and I have certainly learned how many different stakeholders you need to be able to work with, how many different interests you need to take into consideration. And, and uh, as you alluded to initially, um, uh, how many challenges you will have to overcome uh, to, to eventually succeed. And, and you can only do that if you work together across disciplines, across sectors, not limiting yourself uh, to, to, you could say, any one uh, area of expertise, because you never know if it's the legal perspective, the political perspective, the uh, public health perspective, the molecular biological perspective that makes the difference in taking uh, these kind of um, um, issues to the next level and eventually to the point where politicians are willing to intervene and, and make the difference. And, and it is so that we need politicians to eventually make the difference if we want changes to be sustainable. We can come some way through all kinds of voluntary action and, and spreading of, of, of good practices. Uh, but if we want the big changes, then we need politicians to create the political and legal frameworks that confine and, and manage the overall use and the overall behavior of users in this uh, domain. Hendrik, I have read about your personal experience 
during that European Court of Justice legal case. I read that you received a letter from the industry, you know, because you were very strongly testifying, you know, against the industry's interest, of course, for the interest of the public and the interest of the, uh, the world at large. Would you please explain to us how did you overcome such challenges? Because you are a man of action. You, you do a lot and still keep on smiling. You know, still, even, now, even today, after all this, you know, monumental work, very difficult, challenging work, you never got tired and still smiling and you are reached such a good position as the Chancellor of the Copenhagen, the rightful position you, you have achieved. How, do, how did you come such a long way? despite all these challenges. We want to know your personal story, your personal career, because that will be a motivation for the people in the healthcare field, especially in the AMR field, how to overcome the challenges and how to keep on smiling despite challenges. Thank you, Thank you very much. I, I think, I mean, as a person, I am basically optimistic and I believe that, that I mean, we are here to make positive changes so that we, at least uh, when we retire or ultimately depart, uh, leave a better world behind. And, and of course, that's also why I'm a little bit frustrated when I see things going in the opposite direction, at least in some domains, uh, but at least anyone and everyone has to do what we can. Um, more than that, I think in terms of keeping the, I mean, the motivation initially was, I think, driven by purely um, I think I would say scientific um, I mean discomfort or, or even you know it was so counterintuitive that you could have uh, someone claim that if you use you know tons of antibiotics in animal feed it doesn't make it doesn't create any problems it only makes the animals grow a little bit faster. Because that was just to me as a microbiologist and an epidemiologist and, and, and molecular biologist, completely mind boggling that they could even claim it. So I think initially the, the claims that we were faced with when we asked the questions the first time, you know, how come this is even uh, permitted? Uh, and we were presented with these almost ridiculous arguments and also very, very poor documentation of those claims, it was like, you know, ha, this is easy, we're going to show them, we're going to, you know, uh, just do some great science and prove that they are completely wrong. So so that is, initially, I think it was this. Uh, I thought it would be easy because I thought that the truth, uh, scientific truth will always prevail, if I can use that term, you know, if you just, you know, just show it through the science and then everyone else will do the right things. Of course, I got much, much, much wiser down the road, and 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 the world of politics and interests is much more complicated than that. Uh, and you need to know who has interests where in order to know how to navigate. But I think that was initially it, and then um, as it got increasingly complicated, I would say only a, a great partnerships with great colleagues both nationally and internationally. And, and that was really because this, I think everyone was just a little bit, I mean, how can they even say this and, and, and insist that this is the case uh, without wanting to take all our growing scientific evidence seriously uh, or even consider it seriously, but just insisting this is, you know, junk science or you don't understand anything. And, stuff like that we were met with. So so we kind of banded together and, and this group grew. But the the wonderful thing about that group of scientists from, from many different countries was that we maintained, um, I mean, this, uh, you, you, you work, uh, I mean, you're bought off, but you also insist on having fun. You know, when we were together, it was always in great spirit, and and we could also um, laugh uh, at the challenges when they were the highest. You know, and and keep each other uh, in there, and and uh, and and again, when when what we were met with was 
sometimes quite ridiculous, you know, when these big lobby organizations that were hired by the pharmaceutical industry to discredit your name or, you know, they started campaigns on, you know, junk science from me or from other scientists and tried to do all kinds of crazy stuff, which was completely out of our normal way of acting in, in research and, and science communication. Even if you were offended by it, it was also a little bit comic. And if you just kept insisting that, I mean, of course we take it serious because this is that important, but we also just have to, you know, maintain good spirit, maintain uh, optimism, knowing that at the end of the day, as long as we keep producing solid scientific evidence about these associations and these links, I mean, eventually we will win this. And, and of course, in, in this first instance, we did. That is that in Europe or in the EU and attendant countries, because of course they legislate more or less like the EU wants it. Uh, we made this big win, both in terms of the growth models, in terms of the integrated surveillance, linking the surveillance of use and resistance in animals and humans. So maintaining and constant oversight and, and also having increasingly strict legislation on the critically important antibiotics, which is also the case in Europe now. So that is all good, but my big regret was that we did not succeed in the US. Mm. And, and it was just a, pol a co politically completely different ball game over there. And, and we had to, I had to at least acknowledge that the interest of the industries over there in politics is much, much stronger than it is in Europe generally, where I um, experienced that the politicians um, were more concerned about, you could say, the public, um, the public's interest, the voters, direct interests and how would this affect their standing among their political constituency. Whereas in the US, my clear feeling was that, that the deep pockets played a much bigger role and it was much more difficult over there to, to make similar changes. Uh, I thought there was a window of opportunity, but unfortunately it, it closed. So, so we didn't manage to take it to the level where it would have been essentially global because if both Europe and US had moved more or less at the same time in the same direction, it, it would in those days have meant that we had a global um, legislation. Uh, nowadays, it means that we are still, um, everyone is still working in the field of non-therapeutic use of antibiotics in animals, but it's slow and it's not as efficient as we could have hoped for. In 2019, India banned the growth commercial usage of colistin. And because in 2018, we provided evidence to the government that the link between colistin usage in animals and the human resistance. Because in India, colistin is the holy water in the clinical world. My yeah. patient my cancer patient with sepsis can't survive without colistin because carbapenem resistance is so high in the country and colistin is holy water. Farmers have been mixing colistin in the poultry feed. But Indian government was so quick to react when we provided the evidence. We could convince the government very well, you know, because we used the right political channels and we could convince and within a few months government banned. It was a very bold and right decision by the Indian government. Uh, and, and you deserve much credit for that. Uh, and it is, uh, and also the government does, by the way, uh, because it is exactly the right thing to do. Um, and one again, one would hope that the government is also willing to look at the drugs one by one. And, and because our conclusion was at the end of the day, when we looked at all the drugs that were used as growth modes, they were all problematic. And that was why after banning, I think, four drugs one by one, Avopassin and, and Tylosin and, uh, and a few others, Virginia Mycin and one more, uh, essentially, eventually 
EU just said, I mean, this just is not nonsensical. We cannot spend, you know, decades to take them one by one. And and we had shown also scientifically that the growth promotant effect was essentially non-existent. It was just, I wouldn't call it a hoax. It may have been real in the 60s, but it was certainly not real in the 90s. And it's prob probably also not real now. So, so actually the argument that they were beneficial for farmers economy was really not real. And therefore it was easier to say, let's just get rid of all of it. And, and of course, eventually I would hope that, that all countries, but I know this is a, a, a delicate process, but that, that globally we come into a situation where antibiotics are used when they are therapeutically indicated. And only then, and that would be the case both for food animals and for humans, because they are the humans and food animals are the big volume users. I know there are pet animals and there are all other kinds of, of niche areas, but the big volume users are the food producing animals and the humans. And if a consensus could emerge that when we use antibiotics in those domains, it has to be therapeutically indicated, we should always use the most narrow spectrum antibiotic applicable in the in the particular condition as appropriate. Of course, this requires good diagnostics and other services uh, available. And there should be overall a fair separation of prescribing and dispensing. Because certainly in the animal area, uh, the financial interests or the economic interests in many parts of the world drive uh, a, an unfavorable behavior. And, and that both relates to the prescribers who are also the dispensers. If they have to prescribe it also, or they can also just dispense. Um, and then of course, also the, the producers. Uh, so if, we could continue, and I know to some extent we are, but it's a very slow and it's a very um, complicated process. But if we could continue down that path, we could reduce the overall use of antibiotics globally enormously. But it would require better animal production systems with attention to uh, hygiene. Because again, also in animals as in humans, the infections you prevent you don't have to worry about. You don't have to treat. So, so uh, even if we often focus on how to use better or how to use uh, more, you know, um, appropriate, we should never forget about the hygiene, and especially in food animal production, with intensive food animal production, driving a very high need of antibiotic usage. We should also be aware that if we could and we can and it's not rocket science, we can improve food animal production practices so that they don't drive such high uses of antibiotics. That that could make a huge difference. So you, you believe that this growth promotional antibiotic is completely unnecessary? It's not going to reduce the meat output in any way? No, it's... it's the The... Uh, Few situations you could say where the so-called growth promoting antibiotics make a difference is where they, in reality, are um, preventive medication. Uh, but I would always argue that if you should routinely prevent infections by the use of antibiotics, certainly there has to be a veterinary indication. It's not something you buy from the your feed producer who knows nothing about diseases or you know anything. It's just an additive like my minerals and vitamins and what have you. So so if you want, and I would not argue that it was a good thing, but anyway, if food producers in some rare instances needed to constantly dose their animals with antibiotics, I would I would argue that then they need a licensed veterinarian to make that decision on their behalf, because I, the farmer is not able to make the decision, 
based on reasonable health indications. And certainly the feed producer is not at all because they know nothing about health relating to control and management of infectious diseases. So, so, so it's, it's the, the problem is that it's, uh, that antibiotics are being used in the domain where the people involved have limited or absolutely no clue on the consequences of the use. And also uh, maybe are not aware of, you know, uh, the potential long-term effects of their behavior. Uh, so I would always argue that antibiotics should be used by licensed um, professionals and and when it relates to animals, that's the veterinarians. And and for us patients, I mean, I also don't want to have to decide whether I need an antibiotic or not. I want my own doctor to tell me you need one. I make a prescription, and then you go down to the pharmacy and buy it. So I don't have an interest in selling you the antibiotics. I just have an interest in giving you the best prescription for you. And then I go there. And the same for the farmer. I mean, the vet makes the call, the farmer buys the drugs from a pharmacy and uh, give them to the animals. That this fine separation of prescribing and dispensing is I think a very health, healthy mechanism. And of course with growth promotants, it's completely even taken out of that system. It just lives in a parallel universe. And when you could see that more than half of the global use of antibiotics were being actually wasted over there, I think there, there is still is, and even in those days, was sufficient uh, uh, reason to to call for action. Hendrik, I have read your testimony at the U.S. Senate. Oh, would you, would you please talk a bit more about it because that's very, very strongly and powerfully worded testimony. It's really <laughs> inspiring to read that testimony. Oh, thank you. I, I have not read it for decades, so uh, don't ask me to paraphrase it. But but I know that we, and that was exactly in the hope that what we had achieved in Europe, and and it was not our hope. It was the hope of 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 the U.S. health professionals and and some very uh, esteemed institutions and individuals that if they used our experiences and also uh, us uh, who had made the change in Europe in the US to promote similar changes there, change might happen. And, and, and so therefore, uh, I spent quite some time in various contexts, both in the Senate and 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 uh, in the um, uh, Parliament to to argue or Congress uh, to 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 argue the case, um, and even if I, I think I'm, the reason why I'm, I'm hesitating a little bit is because uh, it may have been a powerful argument, but it didn't make the difference. So so it's not that it was wasted, but but I'm sad that that um, that there was no political will to to take it in and to uh, make the changes that we were trying to argue for. But I got to know how powerful uh, the lobby of the agricultural industries and the pharmaceutical industries is in the US. And big respect, I met many of their, their, their experts who are great experts in their own right. But um, they were also very efficient in avoiding, you could say, bolder political decisions. So in the U.S., it's also very slowly one antimicrobial at a time. And 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 the, I think, and I also think data supports that, that the positive changes taking place take place in a slower pace than the growth of the problems we're trying to control. And, 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 and that is what is uh, worrying me. Yeah. And I cannot see right now. Ted Kennedy was a big um, uh, champion in uh, American politics. Obama also tried. Uh, but since then, I have seen limited. But then again, I've also not been involved for quite some time 
I have seen limited desire, desire to make uh, more radical interventions over there. But but again, the testimony still exists. I'm I'm happy to to hear that. And and if the arguments are still valid, I hope they are. Uh, then I hope others can use it, and 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 maintain uh, the push for for these positive changes that we still desperately need to to make. Would you please tell a bit about your personal journey, your education, your childhood, your overall, you know, your your experience as a scientist? I, I, yeah, I can I can try to be be brief. Uh, I, I grew up in, in, in the little country of Denmark. Uh, I think the reason why I eventually decided to work in the field I did was because I, I, in, I mean, I really uh, love farming. I spent all my summers in a little farm in, in Denmark. My parents would go traveling all over the world and they would leave me in this little uh, farm in the middle of the country where I would spend months uh, over the summer holidays uh, looking, uh, you know, it, it was relatives who had that farm and, and just um, that, that was really, I mean, I just loved that place and, and working with the animals and it was a small farm and all kinds of animals as they were in these days. Uh, so it, it was really to me, this working on the farm, working with the animals, it made so much sense to me. So eventually when I um, decided on what I wanted to do, I studied food science, which uh, to me, because I had become very interested in microbiology. Uh, and, and that was because I read the book called Microbe Hunters, which I actually accidentally found in the basement of my uh, grandfather's uh, house. Uh, by Paul de Croif, and I know many microbiologists have come across that book sometime in their early years. And to me, um, this notion of becoming a disease detective was extremely appealing. So, uh, so, and and food science in those days was the degree in this country where you were taught most microbiology from most different angles. So, so I studied that. Uh, I got into molecular um, microbiology, which was um, new in the 80s, and um, and and uh, and initiated started uh, in this country some of the first more comprehensive um, uh, studies on molecular methods to understand the epidemiology of infectious diseases. So from my so for my, my master's degree in food science, where I looked at, uh, at the Yersinia bacterium from pigs and humans and compared uh, the plasmid profiles, um, I, I managed to, to get a PhD in the same area um, where I worked in the, in the National Veterinary Laboratory doing my PhD, but at the same time developing and implementing molecular methods to understand the epidemiology of infections in animals. And, and after finishing my PhD, I wanted to go back to something which was more in the interface between animal and human. Um, as a food scientist, this is what you do. Uh, so I, I, uh, I got funding for some projects that very quickly took off because uh, we got funding for projects to uh, see if we could understand and control Salmonella in um, animals uh, and humans effectively, but but managing them in animals. And that was extremely successful. And we actually managed over some years, more or less, it started before, but it, it was in parallel with working on, on antibiotics that we also managed to get rid of salmonella and egg production and reduce it markedly in, in, in poultry and swine production through this extremely integrated approach so, so in '94, uh, government, um, and that was only two years after my PhD, they gave me the possibility to develop a zoonosis center, which we had proposed that this country needed a research center that was sitting right in the middle of 
animal health and human health and trying to understand the linkages. And, and we had these new methods where you could actually, through molecular techniques, make these links and, and actually make inferences about these infections come from this type of animal or from this food product or from this whatever environmental source. So establishing such a center in, in 94, 1st of January, um, was, I think, pivotal to uh, put me in the place where when Wolfgang Witte called uh, a little later, but not much later, actually just towards the end of that same year, and asked me if we knew anything about VRE, it was quite uh, easy to uh, both get access to the samples where you could then look for this bacterium that we had never looked for before. We were looking for Salmonella and Campylobacter and Yersinia and Listeria and all other kinds of bacteria. But it was easy to add that one. And I was already well connected into the public health laboratory and all the experts out there. So using the same expertise, maybe slightly different experts, bringing together the different uh, groups of experts and working across also the field of industry, food production industry, veterinary profession, um, legislators was not, it was quite easy because I was already there. I was already doing it for controlling foodborne infections. I just had to do the same for, for, for AMR. So, so to that end, um, I mean, I became this, you could say, also, I think it helps. It, it may sound strange, but I actually think it helped that I was not a veterinarian and I was not an MD because those two groups looked in those days at each other with some suspicion. And they were particularly um, not positive about one making claims about the other one's behavior or vice versa. So, so being this kind of neutral uh, go-between, an honest broker, you could say to some extent, being able to bridge um, all the professional, um, maybe even scientific borders between veterinary animal diseases and human diseases, um, infectious disease microbiology, which is very different from uh, microbial ecology, which was more where you come from when you work on, on, on food microbiology. Uh, and also microbiology and epidemiology um, was um, not so strange for me, but for others, uh, it was not so easy. So I think it just helped that I, I, I had access, you could say, to, to, to all domains and work with all kinds of experts. And I was never seen as someone who was particularly one or the other type of expert. I was just like this um, omnipotent, maybe initially relatively harmless <laughs> expert <laughs> who then managed to connect a lot of uh, insights and a lot of goodwills to create good changes. And once, when you've done that once, uh, which was the case for the foodborne infections, where we really made a big change in this country over a very short time, which is also now a European thing, I think they trusted us to do the same for AMR. Um, and and uh, yeah, so, so, so that's at least part of it. I like this holistic approach. I, li I, I like, but I also had to because there was no natural domain for work. When you were a food scientist, you could work anywhere or nowhere. Whereas if you're a veterinarian, you kind of have to work within that box. Or if you're a medic, you by default more or less work within that box. But I could work across all boxes and I could connect all disciplines and 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 I was never um, yeah too keen on being one or the other as long as we could make the changes, as long as we could bring the data together without trying to protect them for each other, you know. Uh, um, so so and that's also where I think uh, this slightly positive, maybe even slightly naive approach made people. Yeah, 
want to share their data to become part of this bigger endeavor uh, and not keep them to their, themselves in their own interest. But it is very important. You have to be a good, I think you have to be a good people person to work in 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 uh, in this field. And and uh, I think uh, at least I was in those days, uh, others will have to judge if I am still, but in those days, I think it helped that people like to work with me and work on these same big dreams or big visions or big, you know, endeavors with uh, where you had to, 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 to work hard, but there was also uh, the chance to be part of something where you could make a, a big impact. Hendrik, you have been a crusader, a thought leader, and now you are the chancellor of the Copenhagen University. Now, your role as the chancellor, how did that influence your approach to both education and research, especially concerning the AMR? As a rector, president, uh, chancellor, whatever term you prefer, different countries have different uh, terms for this uh, post. Um, clearly, I mean, it is uh, other than being a huge honor and a big responsibility to to have this role in one of Europe's leading and most research-intensive universities. It has also become so clear to me how important education is. Of course, you cannot be in a university without um, acknowledging and also seeing on a day-to-day -day basis how important education is for any kind of development and change. So educating, and, and in my university, we educate a lot of doctors, we educate a lot of veterinarians, we educate a lot of microbiologists in all different kinds of fields. Um, so, so, I mean, constantly uh, putting the latest knowledge into education so that our graduates can take this knowledge into society is what really makes a huge difference. Because again, when, when, you, move, when, when you move something initially, a lot of the, what you might um, observe or feel is resistance is simply just because it's new ways of looking at old problems. And therefore, the experts or the, the stakeholders you have to work with are just like, they didn't teach me that at university. How come you now suddenly come and say, this is a problem or this is, you know, you should look at completely differently. So, so that's why it's so important that we keep pouring new information into society. So there are always people in all areas uh, where uh, it's relevant that know about, say, the One Health concept, know about this more holistic, integrated approach to health issues, and now, of course, planetary health and, and all of these uh, urgent changes that we need to make uh, also require that we constantly pour in the best quality of graduates with the most comprehensive sets of knowledge, but also the most open minds who are willing to um, look critically at old um, uh, ways of doing things and are willing also to do the effort to change the way we do things for the better. So education is key and it's at all levels. It's not only university graduates, it's of course, as all levels of our systems. And uh, of course, it has also reminded me how important it is that we work across scientific disciplines. And I'm, I'm so pleased to see, I think I'm more or less, you could say, disappeared into university leadership because I was a provost in another university before I got this job. When we managed to um, really, um, you could say, implement the One Health concept, which I think has been extremely productive as a as a term, as a as a concept, as a framework for working uh, for many professionals. And now I can see sitting in a university that One Health is also something that brings together my university sciences from many different areas of the university to look at complex problems with all the relevant scientific disciplines, and and. We need this comprehensive approach 
to the complex problems. I mean, I, I have had to work with with lawyers and anthropologists and molecular biologists and uh, medical doctors and, and uh, agricultural uh, scientists and what have you over my time, many, many more. I mean, the list is, is infinite. And now I find in my university, of course, uh, all these experts are spread all over. And I see it as, as my very important role to inspire them to come together to address complex problems from this holistic approach. And, and, and I'm also very happy to observe that this is now more the, the, the norm than the exception. And it's, it's both the, the extremely complex public health problems. It's, it's, of course, the climate crisis. It's the biodiversity crisis. It's uh, the green transitioning challenges. So all of these complex challenges has reminded all scientists in universities, you cannot do it on your own. You cannot do it, you cannot even do it within your own niche of science. You have to open up. You have to understand the others. You have to work together. And then on top of that, digitalization of everything we do also has helped to solve traditional borders. In the past, you know, there was a lot of craftsmanship in being a microbiologist. You had to know how to work in a laboratory. You had to know how to do all kinds of stuff. But today, many people who work in uh, microbiology, uh, life science, uh, what have you, can do everything in computers, which of course makes them no different from a, f a physicist who work in theoretical physics in a computer, or a, a chemist, or a, a, even a social scientist, or you know. A, 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 people in, in the arts and humanities who work in the digital domain. So it, it's so easy to bring things together. And it's also so much easier to develop common terminologies about common problems. So all the language barriers I had to try to overcome in the past seem to be slowly diminishing in academia. And when that happens, then we have also not just one health, but we may also eventually have one science to help support us. Uh, and I think we, we need that. Hendrik, whenever I talk about change, I caught Steve Jobs' statement. If you are crazy enough to change, think you can change the world, they are the people who make that change. And Hendrik, you are given us lessons from a different perspective. If you want to make a change, be a people's person, an eternal optimist, and be a, a team player. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You have given us valuable lessons, youngsters, and for us, especially in the field of AMR and in the scientific and health world. Thanks a lot. I'm honored to talk to you for such a long time on, on your life experience. AMR Declaration Trust is honored to have the opportunity to talk to you. Thanks a lot. Good night. Thank you very much, Abdul. Thanks for having me. I will stop the recording.